call again. For well, welcome back, everybody. Um, and we move on to our uh, third talk of the morning, um, which is um, by Hugh Purcell. Now, Hugh has visited India over 30 times since the mid-60s and has conducted tours there. And he's written a book called After the Raj, The Legacy of British India. And if you watch the television, as I try not to do very often these days, there seems to be a huge amount of television about the Raj in India and, of course, Queen Victoria. Um, he spent his career in broadcasting, television and radio, and was managing editor of the BBC documentary department before running a company of his own and teaching documentary film abroad, including in India. Um, opinions and views expressed today are based on history, as indeed we've heard from our first speaker, and the interpretations thereof. In other words, the world before Twitter and Microsoft. Um, Hugh's subject, the British Empire in India, a good or a bad thing, is very important today, and you've only got to look around the room to see how that very subject has affected us, everybody. Hugh, thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Good to have such a full house, and lively crowd of people. Hands up those of you who, uh, you or one of your parents were born in India or Pakistan. Oh, not as many as I thought. Uh, hands up those of you who don't know what the Raj means and couldn't care less anyway. Oh, one, up there in the back. I should be looking at you and hoping I might convert you. Uh, good. Well, uh, so one more question. Hands up those of you uh, who, who think that the British Raj, that was the British Empire in India, was on the whole a bad thing. Ah, and, okay, thank you. And those of you who think, who think it was a good thing, a small minority. Thank you, a small minority. Okay. Well, let's, let's get going then. Uh, first of all, um, what is the British Raj? Now, it might interest you to know that this was never a term used by the British in India during the British Empire. Uh, by the way, Indian independence was 70 years ago this year, so this is a timely talk to be, timely to be doing this talk. The British Raj, meaning rule, was a phrase thought up after 1947 to refer to the British Empire in India. At the time, uh, if you lived in India, you referred to the, the Empire or the Indian Empire. And by the way, uh, Anglo-Indian uh, Anglo uh, now means if you are of a family going back three generations with a male member of the family uh, from Europe, not just the UK, who married uh, an Indian lady, all right? Uh, but uh, at the time, during the empire, Anglo-Indians were known as Eurasians, basically, and an Anglo-Indian was a Brit who'd been working out in India for a lot of his life and had come back to the UK. I just thought that might interest you. So my own connections with India, I went out there first in 1964 when I was your age, well, I was 21. And, um, but even or not, it was easy to travel to India by public transport over land, which I did with two friends. Uh, it, took 40, uh, it took 16 days and cost 40 pounds. One student rail, student, student um, uh, travel passport. So one train uh, from Amsterdam to Istanbul, three days. One train to Erzurum, which is right up in the northeast part of Turkey. Buses across Iran. This is the time of the Shah, local buses. Then, this is the exciting thing, this is a legacy of the Raj. There was a once weekly train that uh, you caught in a 
hellhole called Zaidan, and it took you round the bottom of the Hindu Kush through Baluchistan to Quetta. You wouldn't do it now because it's, it's bandit country. You, you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't even go to Zaidan now, and I know because we've just come back from Iran and Zaidan is a no-go area. And then you were in Quetta, and then you can imagine my wonderful relief and excitement when we hitched up to, um, from Lahore to Kashmir. And Kashmir then was open to tourists, and it was a wonderful Shangri-La. Oh, my God, it was fantastic. And uh, we stayed on a houseboat. Uh, there were the peacocks, and there was the lush fruit, and everything. Um, so, now, in those days, uh, that was um, 17 years after the British had left India, and uh, the, it was still a talking point. Uh, was Churchill... Winston Churchill a good or a bad thing? Well, he was undoubtedly a bad thing for India. In fact, he said that the Hindus were a beastly people with a beastly religion. And in 1940, he said he thought British rule over India would last for a thousand years. So Churchill was a terrible old imperialist, really. And I remember looking at um, a, a quotation on the government buildings in Delhi, built by, designed by Luchans, a British architect. The quotation was... Liberty will not descend to a people, a people must raise themselves to liberty. It is a blessing that must be earned before it can be enjoyed. How patronising. I mean, really, what an offensive thing to have written on a government building. I mean, you know, the British were the occupiers of India. Now, at this stage, I certainly wasn't anti-empire, I was rather pro, but I thought that was an awful thing to write. Anyway, I've been going back uh, ever since, and now, of course... Um, few Indians uh, know anything about the, the British Raj. Um, I remember getting a taxi in Delhi, talking to the taxi driver. He said, oh, I know, so. You, you want to go to buildings of British Raj. Uh, I'll take you to one. Oh, great. And he took me to, to Hermione's tomb, which was, of course, part of the Mughal Empire, dating from, in the case of Hermione, I think the early 16th century. So empires come and go, you know, I mean, and... Uh, the Mughal Empire, the British Empire, you know, one has succeeded the other and had gone, you know, had gone. Um, uh, there are still graveyards, um, Gothic graveyards with tombs of the millions of Brits who, who, who were hundreds of thousands. The figures in my book, actually, who, who died and were buried in India. Um, Calcutta is still quite a British town because it was the old British capital of India and the centre of British commerce, which I'll come back to later. And then, of course, there are the wonderful buildings like the uh, Luchans New Delhi and the railway station in Mumbai, which is an extraordinary bit of what they call Saracenic, which is uh, uh, Gothic Indian architecture. Um, anyway, so I thought I'd write a book um, called uh, After the Raj, and I found 10 or 12 Brits, uh, this was in about 2003, who had been born in India when it belonged to the Raj and had never left. Most of the Brits went back home in 1947. But these had grown up with the new India. And uh, there was a tea planter, a missionary, uh, an awful old uh, uh, big game hunter, who'd become a tiger preservationist in his last years. There was an Anglo-Indian girl who was on the cover, and uh, there was uh, a guy called Nigel Hankin, who'd uh, written a book called Hanklin Janklin, which was about the kind of British Indian language which has emerged during the British time. And what did I think then? I mean, I was still, and I am still, in a way, proud of, proud of the British achievements in India. Um, the railways, for example, I to return to that later, but, uh, you know, if you, many of you have been to India, you'll go on the railways. Uh, they, I mean, this was the network that held and holds India together. It's incredibly efficient, uh, though slow. Uh, you can buy your tickets in North Wembley if you feel like it. <laughs> it's much easier to get your tickets in North Wembley than to queue up at an Indian station. Though if you do queue up at an Indian station and you are with a girl, get her to go to the women-only ticket office because the queue is always a lot shorter, right? Uh, so, 
the the trains were the whole of the railways was was staffed by um, Anglo Indians as it happened they were called the nuts and bolts of empire and I remember going to a community outside Calcutta which was entirely lived in now by elderly Anglo Indians who were so proud of driving the trains uh, and 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 so on. Um, and then, of course, uh, the graveyards, which do tell stories, or rather you can imagine the stories, of uh, many, 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 many Brits who toil their lives uh, in uh, irrigating the land or building the railways or bringing justice or teaching in the schools or being missionaries. Whatever the end result and whatever the motive of all that, their lives actually were dedicated to to uh, to India and they were worn out by the you know the hot sun and the monsoons and the very uncomfortable life now that I do believe uh, I also read um, it's defunct now there's a magazine called uh, the Indo-British Review and which were articles it lasted until the 1990s and there are articles about particularly about old army guys uh, the hundreds went out every year from independence who revisit their old regiments. If you go to a regiment of the Indian Army, it is so like the British Army. I mean, there are bagpipers, there's the regimental silver going back to the uh, days of the Raj. There are the ranks, the same structure, the same kind of uniforms. It's a very British institution, really. So here we are, 2003. Um, a lot of pride in, in, in the British in India, but I do believe that the British, particularly after the mutiny in 1857, never tried to understand India and never did understand India. Uh, if you read a book called The Raj Quartet, which is four volumes by a guy called F Paul Scott, which is a seminal work of literature, you'll know what I mean, but here are a couple of quotes which I picked up when I was writing my book. This one was by a British guy. Like all the British of the Raj, adult or child, I was part of two worlds. I and my kind lived on India, but not in India. This other world, this shadow land, was a place for our averted eyes, a slightly disreputable place, hardly mentioned in decent company. And here's an Indian officer. There was almost no social contact between British and Indian officers in the army. I don't know of a single case in which the British and Indian were very friendly. There was no contact, although we fought the same enemy. They lived their lives in cantonments, little Englanders all over. The British did live in cantonments uh, in their own lines. And up until certainly the 1950s, Indians couldn't go in these cantonments. They were, they were, they were British only, unless you had a pass. Uh, actually, the British officers were very attached to the, their men, but this didn't actually uh, include the officers so much. Perhaps they saw them as rivals, as social equals, I don't know. But I, I do believe the British never really tried to understand India. It's a huge generalisation, but I mean, I stick to it. And I, this is sort of from the mutiny onwards. Anyway, um, basically the Raj, good or bad, I've kind of changed my mind anyway by reading this fantastic book by Shashi Tharoor called Inglorious Empire, What the British Did to India. Uh, hands up those of you who read it. Good, good. Well, it's, it's a good read, isn't it? It's a fantastic read. He, um, he uh, uh, was a deputy director general of the UN. He's a, now a writer a very clear writer, and uh, it's about time this argument was put forward because it, there are far too many books by old guys, British guys who lived in India, talking about uh, the smell of wood fire, fire in the early morning as they went for a ride, or the chink of gin glasses and the mess in the evening and all that. This is, this is sort of the other, the other side. And his basic point, which I don't think actually is... I think it's irrefutable, was that Britain was a colonial power and everything it did in India was first and foremost in the best interest of Britain, including the lever, leaving of it. And he has a good quote, which is a bit mischievous. 
It's not his, it's somebody else's. In the beginning, there were two nations. One was a vast, mighty, and magnificent empire which dominated a massive swathe of the earth. The other was an undeveloped, semi-feudal realm riven by religious factionalism and barely able to feed its illiterate, diseased, and stinking masses. The first nation was India and the second was England. <laughs> However, this was talking about the early 17th century when the East India Company began and the first Brits went out. Um, so let's have a look at the balance sheet, bearing in mind, in a way we should look at it through this colonial perspective, as I will give you an indication. Uh, what was obviously good, in a way, uh, was the English language. It's an official language of India, it's pan-Indian, it's the language of global trade, it unites the Indian middle classes and so on, through television. I mean, if you go to India, as I frequently, you turn on the television, and there are the English-speaking uh, Indian or imported programs on television, uniting sort of social cohesion, English-speaking middle classes. Um, and of course, it enables some of you, only a very small number, to be here, because, uh, you know, uh, Indians, uh, Pakistanis, whatever, you can go to England and America without any language difficulties at all. So it's obviously quite a good thing. But you've got to look at its origin. And back in the 1830s, a guy called Lord Macaulay worked for the East India Company, and he was responsible for the English rather than Persian being the official language of India. And um, he founded the education system in India for you know, the ruling classes once again. Now, this is class ridden times. And he said, we must form a class of persons, Indian in colour and blood, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals and in intellect. He wanted a kind of cadre of Indians who are more British than the British to teach Indians about the British, and uh, the, the, the British rule, the British culture. And the education was quite unashamedly Anglo-centric. Okay, uh, he had two more quotes from Macaulay. The introduction of Western education and Christianity will transform a morally decadent society. A single shelf of a good European library is worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. This is Macaulay in, in 18, speaking in 1830. Um, interestingly enough, Shashi Tharoor, uh, went to St. Stephen's College in Delhi. Uh, his favourite authors are P.G. Woodhouse and, of course, Shakespeare. And he, he sort of, he, he's the legacy of that, which he's the first one to, to admit. But the British were not actually interested in educating the vast mass of Indians. And here's a st statistic which, uh, again, I haven't checked, but it's one of Shashi Thurur's. But when the British left India in 1947, only 16% of males and 8% of females were literate. This was in 1947. Only one in 12 Indian women, women could read or write. So um, it, was a, the, it was the language, undoubtedly a blessing, but you've got to look at it through a colonial perspective. Uh, here's two other blessings which are not so important and really um, uh, I don't think they're so controversial. Uh, one is tea. <laughs> uh, the British discovered tea in Assam in the 1830s because they didn't want to buy it from China. And when I went to India last, or no, to write my book in the 1990s, most of the tea plantations up in Assam and places uh, had only recently been run by Indians. Way up until the 60s and early 70s, they were predominantly Scottish uh, firms like Jardine and Madison who ran the tea plantations. And the tea, by the way, until the 1930s was not grown for Indians, it was grown for the British. It was during the depression in the 1930s that the market was expanded to India. Now, I believe that when you go to India and you drink chai, which is a fantastically good drink, as you know, with milk and cinnamon, that's not what the, Indi the British meant by tea. Their tea, which is now my favourite tea, here is Darjeeling tea, which is, you drink black, and it's what a wonderful pure taste. Um, interestingly enough, 
Do you know that Narendra Modi, he began as a chai walla. If you go to Indian stations, I've always waited for the call of the chai walla. He says, chai, chai, and he comes along to your compartment with uh, wonderful this chai tea. Um, well, that's how Narendra Modi began on a railway station in, in Gujarat. Chai, by the way, I mean, we, we talk about cha, but in fact, chai doesn't come from the Indus word, in, uh, Indian word. It comes from a Chinese word, uh, kai, chai, which was how the Chinese called their tea when it came from Canton, and probably still do, uh, years ago. Now we get on to cricket. Uh, there's a lot of kind of reverse colonial, colonialism now because, you know, the British run our steel industry, uh, the Indians run our steel industry, the Indians run a lot of our car industry, and round Heathrow, it's, it's like where I live, quite near, it's like living in, a, in, a, in, in Mumbai, in a way, and it's the same with cricket. Uh, I ran, I started a cricket team at the BBC, which is now almost totally composed of Indians who've taken it over, and quite right too, because they are the best cricket players in the world. And cricket came from England. Initially, it was kind of the attitude, let's teach the Indians some of the rules of a complicated game that started on the playing fields of Eton. But now, of course, the Indians have taken to cricket, and wherever you go in India, it always amazes me, even if it's a mud pitch and there's not a proper wicket or even a proper bat, Indian boys, they're really good at cricket. I mean, fantastic. Uh, so now let's look at the railways. Um, the railways, as I say, um, uh, I think are one of the prides of India, which you can tell because there are so many programs on British television about railways. Um, the, the, uh, the Viceroy Harding said in 1843, Railways will be beneficial to the commerce, government, and military control of India. That's why the railways were built. Now, of course, they transport masses of Indians all over India. Uh, and it, how some of those of you have been to India? Been to India? Been on the railways? Good. Well, it's a fantastic experience. Um, and, uh, but uh, their origin, uh, they were built by the British, uh, who insisted, by the way, uh, that the uh, railways were built in, the trains were built in Britain. And between 1854 and 1947, about 15,000 trains were exported to India. The Indians weren't allowed to build their own although they had an incipient steel industry, nor were the Indians allowed to invest. It was a British company, and the British who invested were guaranteed 5% interest per year, which is a big, colossal increase over the years. But if that 5% uh, had not been earned by the railways, it was paid for by the Indian taxpayer, right? Um, and the staff were, were British or Anglo-Indian. The, the Indians were not allowed to have any senior uh, uh, role on, on the railways. And that is why uh, when the British left, well, even when the British were there, the Anglo-Indians uh, were the train drivers, the mechanics, so on and so on and so on. So, uh, the railways, one can be proud of all these things, and I, I am, but you've got to look at them through perspective of the colonial past. Uh, now let's look at the, the, what um, we all say, oh, well, like I say, the, the British brought India democracy. Uh, democracy you could define as probably a free press, a parliamentary democracy, and the rule of law. And a free press, it is true. The British did give, allow Indians to, they, they encouraged a free press uh, in the 19th century. Uh, they did, in fact, uh, impose um, a levy of £5,000 per year from every paper, Indian paper. There was a lot of money in those days. So if the paper ran an article or so which was very anti-British, they could confiscate its levy, right? And indeed, it was certainly also true 
that anything considered uh, revolutionary or subversive, uh, you would be sacked or end up in the Andaman Islands. But nevertheless, the, the, the India's free press today, the, most of the big papers, the, uh, the Times of India, the Times of Calcutta, the Hindustan Times, were all from the 19th or early 20th century, mostly from Calcutta and encouraged by the British. Um, if you now look at um, uh, democracy, um, well, the, the Indians, I mean, before 1947, there wasn't much democracy. I mean, it was, it was the, the uh, Nehru and his socialist government who decided to adopt the British model, uh, rightly or wrongly. Uh, in fact, uh, if you're interested in this, uh, on pages 86 to 88, Shashi Tharoor argues that a parliamentary system of democracy on the Western model is not right for India. It would be much better to have a more presidential system, which you could argue Narendra Modi is moving over to. But, I mean, that's not for this talk, but I'll recommend it. Before 1947, there was a gradual movement towards uh, more democracy, but it was at the uh, provincial and local level and, for example, the early reforms, they were known as the Montague Chelmsford Reforms of 1919, which set up provincial assemblies. The Brits could veto the legislation, control the taxation, keep charge of security, and was a very limited property franchise to vote. And that didn't alter very much uh, until independence. So, in fact, the British really ruled through a system of enlightened de despotism. However, uh, well, rightly or wrongly, the British system, the Indian system now is based roughly on the British model. Um, here's a very interesting quote from the um, Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen, the uh, Indian Nobel Prize winner economist, right? This is fasc fascinating. There's never been a famine in a country with a free press and a parliamentary democracy. There's never been a famine in a country with a free press and parliamentary democracy. Now, uh, in the 20, but in possibly the 100 years, 1857, 1947, 30 or 40 million Indians lost their lives in famines, which is analogous to those who lost their lives in the Gulag or uh, much more than in the Second World War. Uh, there have not been famines, famines since. Uh, under nourishment, yes, famines, no. So his argument is that if you have a, a freedom to elect your officials uh, and to rise up uh, in, a, in, a, in a rise up in a peaceful way. Uh, then you don't. You can stop. You can stop famines, and I, I, I just commend that to you. Um, we now look at the rule of law, which I think this will interest you. Um, the rule of law in India, the criminal code, uh, was laid down by Macaulay. Again, it, 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 it became law after he died, actually, in 1861. And the president of India said in 2016. 2016, only last year, our criminal law largely enacted by the British to meet colonial needs and Victorian attitudes. Now, it's a very good thing to me that this code of law means uh, jurisprudence, courts, uh, adversarial system, that's more debatable. But anyway, the whole structure of law that we have in this country is in India. But, by God, it is now ripe for change. Um, I was looking the other day, it might interest you, of the laws on sex in India. Um, the India's rape law, enshrined in the colonial era of 1861, requires a victim to establish her good character, and she has to prove that, that rape has occurred. Section 2... Which, I mean, number two, section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, uh, it's, there is still a law which criminalizes carnal intercourse against the order of nature. That means between gays. That's now, between, now in front of the Supreme Court, but in 19, 2014 and 2015, there were 58 arrests in India under that law. 
Um, further, a wife cannot sue her husband for adultery uh, unless he, the, the mistress is under age or married to somebody else. Just thought you might like to know that. This is the English penal law of 1861, uh, which is still in, in, in law in India, another legacy of the British. Okay, so at the moment, the moment so far, I mean, I, I see a lot of good things only through the perspective of colonialism. A lot of uh, things today which are good and bad. I think what, is, what was bad, indisputably bad, uh, was uh, the looting of India. And uh, in 1800, 25% of the world trade came from India. In 1947, only 3% of world trade came from India. Now, you might say, why does it matter today? By God, India is so dynamic. What, what is the growth rate? 6 8%. You've taken over our steel industry. You've taken over our car industry. You, you know, you're knocking your spots off us. But what would it be like if the baseline had been a lot higher in 1947? Uh, I'll just um, take, uh, for example, cotton. Uh, in 1800, uh, the Indian cotton, Indian textiles, this is the point, were a thriving industry. Uh, about... Um, 25%, the same figure again, 25% of the global trade in exiles, uh, in the global trade in textiles. Uh, the British didn't want this because they wanted textiles to be put together, the pyjamas, the shirts, the trousers and so on, in the mills of Lancashire. They wanted raw cotton from India. So the irony was, and the, the in a way, the, the insult was, that the East India Company would destroy the uh, handlooms in India and put a whopping great uh, tariff on exporting textiles into Britain. Meanwhile, the British, they had to buy back their own cotton, now turned into shirts and pyjamas and all the rest of it, coming back from the UK. That changed, by the way, in... Uh, uh, 18, 19, 1920s and 30s and I, I go to Cornpore, now Camper quite a bit and uh, it is known as the Manchester of the North and you can still see the ruined textile mills but for a long time uh, that was the case uh, then there were the management agencies if you go to Calcutta uh, you find the old management agencies which um, uh, uh, looked after the export of all India's raw materials, jute, textiles, tea, silk, uh, and so on, uh, into Britain. They were known as sterling companies, which meant they were owned by the British, only the British could run them. And uh, they, they, that, that was because the British wanted raw materials from India. They didn't want made-up products, they wanted raw materials. And uh, I happened to read a book when I was writing my book, about an Indian accountant and the big uh, managing agency of Jardine Matteson wanted him on the board and this is now 1955-56 nearly 10 years after independence because he was an accountant very clever an accountant so how to appoint him they wanted to take him to the Bengal club which is where you know these sort of uh, nice dinners were held where you invited someone to join the board of a big company but this accountant wasn't allowed in because even nearly 10 years after independence the Indians were banned from the Bengal club so they had to have a little dinner in an annex but he said, he said um, I'll give the British one thing they realise how stupid they are and they get us Indians actually to get the sums right and he ended up running of this biggest managing agency. <laughs> it's an interesting story. Uh, I could... Um, so, the supply of manufactured exports to the world markets fell to 2% by 1947. Um, uh, and I could talk about the steel company just in a sentence. When the Tartars tried to set up the steel company, 
earlier in the 20th century, they had great difficulties because the British didn't want them to do it, so they insisted that steel produced was to the British standard, BSSS, rather than the world standard, which the, India had a healthy export to. And having, when Tata made the steel according to the British standard, there was a quota imposed on the amount of steel that could be exported to Britain. So the British were having their cake and eating it. Um, so I, I do believe the British looted India uh, over, over 100 years. Uh, finally, and I think this is um, controversial possibly, let, let, let's look at partition, right? Which you've all been no doubt seeing films about, reading about. This was in 1947 where the British left India and uh, it caused such, that because of the lack of agreement between Muslims and Hindus, uh, actually the, the subcontinent was subdivided between Pakistan, east and west, and India in the middle, and millions fled uh, either east or west with tremendous uh, uh, suffering. Now, it, one thing you cannot say, and I mean it is said a lot, is that actually um, the British did not want to give up India. By the time partition happened in 1947, the British had had India. They wanted to get out. They'd been ruined by the Second World War. Uh, it was a socialist government. Churchill was not in power then. I'm just correcting a recent film on the subject, which got it all wrong. Uh, Attlee was in power. He was a socialist. He had tried different ways to uh, leave India with a peaceful solution. There will be the federal solution, the Balkan solution, the princely state solution, all these ways. But in the end, Jinnah wanted Pakistan. He wanted he didn't want an Islamic state then. He wanted a state for Muslims to live in, not quite the same thing. But he wanted Pakistan and he was going to have it. Uh, Gandhi said, let Jinnah be prime minister of the whole of the subcontinent, if that's what he wants, but let us not be divided. But Nehru said, no, we must have, we must have partition. Uh, so uh, was it wrong to do it so quickly? Yes. Was the line incorrectly drawn? Probably yes. On the other hand, the fact that there was partition like that was not, in my view, in the short term, the result of the British. So now we'll go along to the longer term view, and I would say the British had a lot to answer for, because the British all along had the policy of divide and rule, i.e., let Muslims be Muslims and uh, Hindus be Hindus and Sikhs be Sikhs and so on, and Tamils be Tamils and so on. And uh, a, a highly esteemed historian called Ramala Tapa uh, of Indian history would talk, she writes really quite eloquently about the far more integration between the Muslims and the Hindus before the British came along and one of the British notions, for example, was, oh, the, the, uh, the real India, the Hindu India, uh, which was uh, 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 thousands of years old and had Sanskrit writing and its own, its own wonderful legends, that is the real India. And then the Muslims came along uh, in the late 15th century and uh, set up the Mughal the, the Mughal Empire in North India with uh, you know, Akbar and Shah Jahan and all the rest of it. And I mean, in a way that's true, but that was always the interpretation. It was the uh, Hindus were there first and then the Muslims, uh, you know, by conquest. This was always constantly harped on. To be more specific, um, anyway, so that was the British narrative. When, when the Congress party began, in the 19th century, the early founders of the Congress Party, who were partly British, wanted it to be for both uh, Hindus and Muslims. But the British said, no, 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 it has to be for Hindus. 
uh, would have a Muslim League for Muslims. And so there you started the political division. And then in 1906, uh, Lord Curzon actually divided Bengal into East and West, which caused tremendous controversy. One of our main objects is to split up and thereby weaken a solid body of opponents to our rule. That was undone in uh, 1911, but the, the foundation, if you like, of what is now East uh, Bangladesh and so on, uh, and one on the one side and Bengal on the other, was the division in 1906. In all the kind of statistical events like censuses and the political arrangements like composition of assemblies, it was always done on a kind of religious basis. Uh, and all this aggravated the tension between Hindus and Muslims, which we still live with today. So, finally, um, Shashi Tarur said, the creation and perpetuation of Hindu-Muslim antagonism was the most significant accomplishment of British imperial policy. The project of divide et imperia culminated the horrors of partition. Now that, I, I believe, though the actual events of 46-47, uh, I think the British on the whole have been, have been, have been hold responsible uh, unfairly. So, there you go. I'm very keen to ask any questions that there might be.